In May 1940, during the Second World War, on the outskirts of Oświęcim, which the Germans called Auschwitz, Hitlerites established a concentration camp called Auschwitz I, also known as Stammlager. The camp was supposed to serve as an instrument of terror and afterwards extermination of thousands of Polish patriots. As the number of prisoners was growing, so did the camp's territorial range, which was transformed into an enormous death camp. In 1941, in a village called Brzezinka, located three kilometers away from Oświęcim, the construction works on the second camp, called K.L. Auschwitz II Birkenau, had begun. In 1942, another one, named K.L. Auschwitz III, was built on the grounds adjoining the IG Farben Industrie plant in Monowice, near Oświęcim. In the years 1942-1944, approximately 40 affiliate camps of different sizes were built, mainly in Upper Silesia. All of them were subject to K.L. Auschwitz III. In Brzezinka, right next to the extermination camp for men and women, another death camp had been in operation since spring 42, where people were gassed with Cyclone B in chambers designed for this purpose. The bodies were buried at first, but later they were incinerated. In 1943, additional gas chambers and crematories were built in Auschwitz-Birkenau too. It was a horrible factory of death. During the period of the highest intensity of transports, the number of murdered and then incinerated was close to 20,000 a day. The bodies were incinerated not only in crematories, but also on stakes in large pits dug nearby. The transports of those sentenced to death were sent straight from the trains to the gas chambers without any registration. That is why it is not possible to determine the exact number of casualties. As the historians estimate, in fewer than five years of its existence, between one and one and a half million people died in Auschwitz. The highest intensity of the transports was from May through August 1944 and was linked to the extermination of more than 400,000 Hungarian Jews. In addition to Jews from Poland and almost every other European country, among those who were also killed by gas were Gypsies, Poles, French, Russians, and others that were considered unable to be further used for slave labor, the sick, children, and old people. More than 405,000 registered prisoners, mostly from Poland, but also of different nationalities, went through the Auschwitz concentration camp. Of these, approximately 340,000 overworked and devastated by disease, hunger and inhuman treatment were killed in executions carried out in Auschwitz I, in Block 11, known as the Death Block mainly from the orders of drumhead court-martials, and others were murdered by SS men and prisoner functionaries. 
The camp complex was gradually expanded to the predetermined capacity of approximately 500,000 prisoners. Slave labor for the SS companies and industrial concerns. In the fall of 44, up against the approaching Red Army, the prisoners were gradually evacuated into Germany. On January 18, 1945, after murdering 98,000 prisoners, approximately 58,000 people were evacuated from the camp. In extremely cold temperatures, barefoot and deprived of food, those who were unable to keep up with the rest were killed. On January 27, 1945, the Soviet army liberated the camp and around 7,000 remaining prisoners, among them 180 children, most of whom were seriously ill. The concept of Jewish Holocaust and, subsequently, of Slavic nations was born in Adolf Hitler's mind. It was adopted by his notables such as Adolf Eichmann and Heinrich Himmler. The Holy Scripture sheds some light as to why this happened. The Bible lifts the curtain of history and shows us what happened behind the scenes that was unnoticeable for the human eye. From the perspective of the biblical history of philosophy, the Holocaust of Jews and Slavic peoples was inspired in the minds of Hitler and his associates by Satan. The Holy Scripture says that human mind can be under influence of the powers of darkness or God. How exactly Satan impacts our minds? We don't know that. Similarly, we don't know how God does that. God knows our thoughts, which is proven by numerous teachings of the scriptures. Does Satan know our thoughts? Is he able to enter our minds? It is hard to say. It is possible that by analyzing our behavior, our desires and words, he draws conclusions as far as our thoughts and intentions are concerned. He evaluates our natures, our personalities, and good and bad traits, our strengths and weaknesses. In any case, it is certain that Satan can influence our mind and take it over. The battle between good and evil takes place in our minds, in those mind spheres of human beings, begins the history of mankind, wars, and death camps. We have examples in the Holy Scripture of what people in high positions in the military and government are capable of if their minds are possessed by powers of darkness. The oldest biblical history that deals with the destructive influence of Satan on minds of those who are in power is described in the book of Job. The book of Job from the Old Testament dates back to the 15th century BC, and it is possible that it was written by Moses. It tells the story of Job, an affluent and pious man who lives in an ancient land of Uz in the Middle East 
and his experiences closely connected to Satan's work. Let us hear what the book of Job says. Let us read a passage from the book of Job, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels, and five hundred yoke of oxen, and five hundred she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned, and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Job is introduced in the first verses of the book of Job. He lives in the land of Uz, which is situated on the border between what is today's Jordan and Saudi Arabia. He is very affluent, which means he is well-known and influential. He is also pious to such degree that he preventively makes propitiatory offerings to God for his family, if by any chance they committed a sin. Job is pure and exemplary. Further on, in chapter 1 of the book of Job, from verse 6 through 12, we read as follows. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. One day in heaven, as we read, in God's throne room, the heavenly council has gathered. It consisted of heavenly beings, which in the text are named God's sons, most likely representing other worlds and civilizations, subservient to God. Unexpectedly, Satan also came to the heavenly council. God suggested to Satan that he, as a fallen angel who rebelled against God, shouldn't be here. Then Satan said that he represents the kingdom of the earth, and earth is part of the universe. That is why he has the right to be a part of the deliberations. God said, that Satan is not fully entitled to represent the earth, and it still has a number of people who are faithful to God, and gave Job as an example. To this, Satan slandered publicly God and Job in front of the entire heavenly council. He stated that the relationships of God and Job are based on self-interest. Job worships God for the blessings and tangible benefits he has been receiving. 
He proposed to put the sincerity and selflessness of Job's faith to a test. He tried to convince everyone that if Job was deprived of all that he has achieved, he would definitely turn away from God. With a heavy heart, in order to save Job and prove that Satan is lying, God permitted that the accused took away everything except of life and good health from Job. What happened? Let's continue reading the very same chapter, verses 13 through 15, and then 17. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them, and took them away. Yes, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped, alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away, yes, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And so, one day from the south of the Arabian Peninsula, there came the army of the king Sheba. They invaded Job's premises. They murdered and pillaged. One of the surviving servants reported to the patriarch about this. How did this idea come into existence in the minds of the military leaders of the Sheban armies? Why would they invade Job's premises? The answer is obvious. In order to realize his plans against God and Job, Satan influenced the minds of Sabaean generals. He gained control over them and used them against Job. I am sure that they didn't even realize that they were simply just pawns in this game. In the meantime, from the north, from the distant Chaldea and Babylon, the Chaldean armies came and ravished the remaining lands that belonged to Job. The servant who survived this conflagration reported to the patriarch about this. We have no doubts that the Bible is indeed showing us the details of the great battle between good and evil that we mortals don't always see in the first place. Satan gained control of the military leaders of the Chaldean armies and led them against Job. They were also unaware of the fact that they were just cogs in this vile intrigue devised by Satan against God's justice. The New Testament, which is closer to our times, proves that people who are guided by Satan can commit crimes against innocent people. The evangelists always give the example of Judas, one of the disciples of Jesus. Most likely, there must have been some darkness in Judas's mind. It is certain that God, using his own methods, tried to help Judas to choose the just way of life and reject Satan's impact on his mind. In the end, however, Judas gave way to temptation, and Satan possessed his mind entirely. It was at this moment that Judas decided to betray Jesus. Saint Luke clearly wrote that Judas betrayed Jesus when he was possessed by Satan. Most likely, it happened on Tuesday, four days before Friday when Jesus was crucified, in the spring of 31. Let us hear from the Gospel of Luke, namely chapter 22. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, 
which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas surnamed Iscariot, being one of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains, how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. The final divinely inspired record of the New Testament, which I would like to analyze in reference to today's topic, is a fragment of the Epistle to the Ephesians. The Epistle to the Ephesians was written by St. Paul during his first imprisonment in Rome in the years 61 to 63. It was a time when Christianity became the object of persecution not only by Jews, but also Rome. In the near future, the fire of Rome was supposed to happen for which Emperor Nero was going to blame the Christians. In the context of the increasing repressive measures against the Christians, St. Paul wrote the following words in the Epistle to the Ephesians, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The disciple explains that the enemies of the Christ's worshippers are not Jews, Romans, the emperor, nor pagan officials of the Roman Empire. In this transcript, St. Paul unveils the curtain that separates the visible world from the invisible one and shows that those people are nothing but instruments in the hands of evil, Satan and demons. Satan and his demons, the fallen angels, in order to destroy the Church of Christ on earth, gained control of the minds of Romans, Jews, the emperor, and his officials and used them against Christians. They became puppets in the hands of Satan. Satan was the prime mover and inspiration for their persecutions of Christ's believers. They were under his influence. Earlier in his letter, St. Paul described Satan as the prince of the power of the air and called him the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. At the same time, he calls people living under Satan's influence the children of wrath. Let's look at the second chapter of the Ephesians and read verses 1 through 3. And you hath he quickened, who are dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. According to this Ephesians quote, we can indeed view Hitler's Holocaust culprits as the aforementioned children of wrath, who by believing Satan agreed that he worked inside of them and as children of disobedience used them to commit genocide. Jesus opposed to the general blaming of God for all the evil on earth. His protest is seen in the parable of the wheat and the tares. The parable is written down in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 13. There we shall read verses 24 through 30. Jesus said, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. 
But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. And next we read, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And so we see that Jesus explained that God created a perfect world free of evil. Evil came into existence because of Lucifer's rebellion. The master's servants were surprised that tares grew in the field. They were also the first to blame the master, that is God, for it. In the parable, Jesus attributed the wheat infestation of the field to Satan and he compared evil people to tares. Even though evil will exist until the end of the world, it won't exist forever. In the day of the final judgment, it will be erased forever. Blaming God for Auschwitz is a mistake. It results from the ignorance of the Holy Scripture, where this problem is explained. Most of the people who don't know the Scriptures blame God for the horrors of concentration camps because this is the easiest thing to do. It is so easy to blame God for it. It is, however, unfair and derogatory toward God. The scriptures unveil the backstage of the history of mankind that is invisible for the human eye. The deprived people who allowed evil to enter their mind are responsible for what happened at Auschwitz-Birkenau and in many other places. God, on the other hand, has nothing to do with this crime. Polish writer Zofia Naukowska, in her medallions, in the act of indictment for all the evil of the Second World War, wrote, People brought this fate upon people. People brought this fate upon people. There is one more question to answer. If God is not responsible for concentration camps, why is it that He allowed them to happen? We will answer this question in the next episode of our considerations, entitled Auschwitz-Birkenau. Where was God? Why would God let this happen?